Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us today. I am beyond thrilled to be here talking about and leading the panel of one of my favorite topics, as many people in the audience know. I apologize if I bored you with the topic in the past, but now it's mainstream. Look at what we have. So we're talking about innovation and ideas to action and innovation and what comes next for clean energy. So we want to make this panel as informative and fun, we have fun talking about innovation, right, as possible today. So what I'm going to do is actually we're going to jump right in. Each of my panelists are going to first, actually, we're going to first just say where, you're, where each of you are from, and then we're going to turn it over to Jeremy to give an overview on the market of innovation and the work that ClearPath has been doing over the past few years. And then we're going to go, jump into some company examples and different technologies and where they are in the market. And then the real fun part is asking them the hard questions. So we on, I only have two prepared difficult questions. Well, they're not difficult because you guys know them already. But two prepared <laughs> questions to um, pull some good ideas out and bring some issues, even issues, to light. But then also I encourage you guys to think through and make sure that if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. We will have a few minutes to do so at the end of the panel. So with that, quick introductions on who is who. Sure. Uh, Jeremy Harrell, I'm a managing director at ClearPath, which is an NGO here in DC focused on clean energy innovation and accelerating clean energy deployment. I'm Steve Driscoll from Siegel Nanotechnologies, and we make uh, next generation materials for, bat for batteries, lithium ion batteries. I'm Gaywin Quantz, CEO for Solid Carbon Products. We convert CO2 into materials that go into the human built environment. We do it profitably, and it's a net sequestration play. I'm Harlan Bowers with X Energy. We're a nuclear company that's developing advanced reactor and uh, fuel for those advanced reactors. Great. Jeremy, kick us off. Sure, sure. I think. Uh, um, is you guys have witnessed and, and the folks in here in this room watching what's going on in DC, uh, climate and clean energy has really gone, come into the forefront over the last year. I think uh, the Green New Deal proposal that uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Alexander uh, Ocasio-Cortez uh, put forth really spurred um, conversation, uh, largely, uh, at least from my opinion, a wide array of uh, unrealistic uh, components that are in it, but I think was extremely important to uh, kick-starting this conversation and uh, really forcing uh, members, uh, companies, and stakeholders to talk about, well, if this isn't realistic, what is, what is practical? Um, so I think that's been important for the here DC political debate. Um, I think that uh, some other components that we've seen over the last um, six months to a couple years, uh, the international conversation really accelerating. Um, obviously, the, the Paris Agreement while the Obama administration was in, uh, President Trump's decision to to pull out of it, and really a, a significant uh, attention to what are some realistic pathways to reaching deep decarbonization scenarios. And um, it's forced uh, some tough conversations about uh, the technologies that we have currently, um, clean energy growth uh, across the globe, but making a lot of progress, but simply not st keeping, keeping up with the, the growth of, of energy demand um, across, across our planet. Um, and then I would say here in, in DC, or in uh, the United States, uh, the private sector really you've seen uh, some major shifts as well. Uh, you know, just last week, uh, Duke at DTE earlier here today, um, talking about their commitment to, to go to near zero emissions. Uh, Duke last week, um, Excel Energy, all these utilities are setting some ambitious objectives, whether it's somewhere between an 80% CO2 emission uh, objective or, or a net zero by 2050. Um, every single one of them are saying, hey, we're, we're investing in renewables, we're deploying these technologies, but we don't have the entire technology tool set that we need to meet these objectives. Um, it's just a practical reality of them managing the grid, and so they're going to need dispatchable assets as well as um, cheap renewable technologies and, and energy storage technologies to, to meet um, these objectives. And, uh, you know, beyond the utilities, you're seeing oil and gas companies, the big oil and gas companies. I was in the, up in New York on, on Monday for, uh, for Climate Week activities. The Oil, Gas, and Climate Initiative announced kind of their first round of a, of a billion dollars worth of investments in clean tech, kind of across the space of uh, CO2 utilization, carbon capture, um, sustainable transportation. Uh, you're seeing a real shift in the, in the private sector as well. Some companies, folks like Shell, tying executive compensation to their emissions reductions. So all these things are kind of coming together, both U.S. Um, uh, public policy shifts, uh, an accelerated global conversation, and the private sector really seeing that, that the consumer um, and societal pressures are, are, are asking them to take the serious climate problem 
um, by, the, by the horns and, and make significant progress uh, on action. Yeah, I mean, Jeremy and I talk <clears throat> regularly, whether he likes it or not. Um, but what we've agreed multiple times, like in Dallas at EarthX in April, we've seen this transition coming, we knew it was coming. And what's important about where we are now and what's been so awesome about the developments you just talked about over the last two, uh, year or two is that now we have technologies like we're going to hear about actually having, a, I, I don't want to call it easier yet because we're still going to talk about some of the issues that you're going to face moving forward, but a clearer and more aggregated and supported path to market. So with that, um, Steve, do you want to sure. talk about <clears throat> what you're doing with Sela? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Sela Nanotechnologies was founded in, uh, in 2011. Um, <clears throat> it's a sort of quintessential Silicon Valley story <laughs> with our founder who was a uh, Ukraine-born immigrant, dropped out of Stanford to join Tesla as employee number seven. Uh, got some exposure to the automotive industry and the electrification part of that automotive industry and then broke away to do his own thing um, to, to do his own thing around batteries and so he got together with a, a group of uh, venture capitalists and uh, they, they ended up being able to spin out some, some promising technology from a uh, lab at Georgia Tech where he met uh, one of his co-founders and so the thing that the thing that we noticed early on um, is that the electric car is largely about the battery. And the reason that, so the reason that our company is focused on the battery and in particular on the chemistry, the internals, how that battery operates is because there's a, there's a large need for it and there's a large need to improve, improve how the battery operates. The battery in the electric cars that you're using today um, was basically <clears throat> developed decades ago in order to power your laptop. And we're in a different world now. There's a lot more demands on that battery. That battery is basically the engine of, your, of the electric car and is one of the keys to unlocking mass deployment of electric vehicles and all of the things that, that comes with, uh, with the electrification. And so, um, so what we do is we make the active energy storing material in uh, we make the active energy storing material that will replace the current graphite material in a lithium ion battery. Our material is fundamentally different in the chemistry. It's based on silicon, which is a very abundant material. Um, it's, it's used in all, all sorts of applications, as I think everybody here knows. But so we have spent a lot of time and a lot of money developing this silicon based material um, in order to increase the energy density of the batteries in your, in your car and, and for other applications. Uh, importantly, the material that we've developed is a drop-in replacement for that graphite. So today, there's a whole infrastructure around making, manufacturing batteries. And we're not trying to replace that entire infrastructure. There are companies who are trying to do that. That's a much longer, longer path and good luck, <laughs> good luck to them for, on that one. But um, we are... <clears throat> We're instead focusing on the, the, uh, the key energy storing ingredient of that battery. And so with, with our material, what we're able to do is come to increases of about 20 to 40% boost in energy density. That's important for a whole wide range of applications uh, from the, the wearables on your, on your arm to the hearables in your ear to cell phones to cars and even beyond to, to grid storage. And all those things are, are on our roadmap as a company, don't get me wrong, but it's really the electric vehicles that we're focusing on and that we're most interested in. And as a company where we think we can make the biggest impact on the world, like everyone here is, is trying to do. So um, <clears throat> it's electric vehicles that are kind of the focus of our roadmap today. And in that regard, we have uh, a lot of partnerships with the, with the automotive industry, including two announced partnerships, one with BMW and one with uh, Daimler Mercedes. And those, those partnerships are really helping us springboard into that automotive market. Um, so currently we're in qualification with those two partners uh, as, well as, as well as other partners uh, for getting our material uh, out there and going into, into the real world. It's a, it can be a long qualification process for anybody who's worked <laughs> with the automotive market. Um, but you know, rightfully so, it's a, every, there are human lives on the line, so it's completely understandable. But uh, I guess our, our current situation is really ramping up in getting that qualification done and then really starting to, 
to scale so we can uh, start that meaningful impact on the world. Yeah, but strategic partnerships with capital, always helpful but not key, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But yeah. Gaywin, do you want to introduce yourself and what you guys are doing and where you are and what's left? <laughs> well, it's a personal story. How many of you have kids? How many of you have members who serve in the armed forces in your family? That's what started this for us. Our son was deployed to Iraq. He's fine, okay? He's an army ranger. He's a major. He's fine. He's totally good. But first deployment, we didn't hear from him for 21 days at a time. Then we'd hear from him for seven, then not for 21. That was 2007. That was when folks were asking Rumsfeld, where do we send the steel plates? Well, his dad was a mechanical and chemical engineer, and he said, I've got to get better armor for the kids in the armed forces. So he researched, where's the best possible armor made out of? Turns out it's made out of high aspect ratio carbons, carbon, tube, carbon nanotubes, carbon nanofibers. But they're too expensive to be, even be used for the delta force. So Dallas decided to come up with a better way to make carbon. Read about it for a year, figured it out, built a lab in the basement, and it worked. 26 patents later in the US, 34 internationally. The noise process, named after the founder, takes CO2 and hydrogen, or CO2 and methane, through a catalytic conversion process and produces carbon and water. 3.7 tons of CO2, 0.3 tons of hydrogen gives you one ton of carbon, and three tons of water. If you're paying attention to the math, that means that the noise process is a net sequestration. It puts carbon away. How's carbon currently made? How are the current 14 million tons of carbon black made? It's made by partial combustion of a heavy fraction of oil. Where's that carbon used? 70% in your tires. The rest and everything black around us, okay? So, the noise process, if it underlay, if it replaced all carbon manufacturing right now that's being done by combusting oil, over the next 12 years, over a gigaton of CO2 would either be avoided into the environment or completely displaced into carbon. That'd be cool. We're part of a very large set of solutions that need to come into place. The DOE is aware of what we're doing. We were honored by a visit from two of their engineers a week ago. They know what we're doing. We can take any industrial grade source of CO2. Oh, profitability, let's get to that. Um, <laughs> at a pilot production scale where we're operating now, no way it's profitable. At the next scale of operation, which is 50 ton a month and we are raising the money for it, I need money for that. Any of you that are involved in an organization that want to do good, take my card, help us get the rest of the money in place. That 50 ton a month, we're using that carbon and converting it to synthetic graphite, which is going to also be an important building material because rather than using, again, a heavy fraction of oil or pitch from coal to make synthetic graphite, we do it out of CO2. How cool is that? So. 50 ton a month unit is going to be outrageously profitable. Once we're at 500 ton a month, we are competitive with the current manufacturing process for carbon black. 14 million tons a year, $18 billion. Did I just say you could do environmentally good and make profit at the same time? Yeah, you can. <laughs> okay, it's called upgrading technology. The reason why New York doesn't have people running around shoveling up the horse poop is because <laughs> cars came into being, introduced a different form of contamination, but it was an upgrade in transportation technology. Yay for electric vehicles next, mm -hmm. okay? So, what do we do? We started off protecting our son. Turns out we're doing something bigger. Help us. That's a tough act to follow, man. <laughs> oh, by the way, one little thing. I used to be in nuclear. I was a commissioning engineer, Ontario Hydro Canada. I was one of the last people that came out of the Calandria for Unit 6 because my system was shut down System 2. Nuclear is good. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> oh, Harlan. Okay, can I take it away? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Uh, so, so X Energy was started in 2009. We've been, uh, we've been viable and in, in, in existence uh, for 10 years now. Uh, it's important to note how we got started, and, and it was not started as a nuclear company. The original goal was let's do something new in clean energy space. Uh, and and it, could have, it could have been any technology. Uh, Cam Gaffarian, our founder and chairman, sponsors a elementary school in Kinshasa, the Republic of Congo. Several hundred students, uh, uh, children, come to that, uh, that school every day. And in Kinshasa, you can really see what the impacts are of not having clean, affordable energy. Bad roads, bad schools, bad environment. Uh, and so that was the, the initial purpose of, of X Energy. But if you want to make a global impact uh, and, and, a and a broad set of applications, nuclear is a good way to do it. Uh, and specifically, we started looking at advanced nuclear and more specifically, something called a high temperature gas cooled reactor technology, or HTGR. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about what, what is an HTGR. Um, and, and some attributes associated with it. So, so start with uh, uranium kernel, um, half a millimeter in diameter, about the size of the head of a pin. Uh, and then you take that kernel and you coat it in graphite and silicon carbide. Um, and by doing that, you create, create a hermetic seal around that uranium kernel. We call that a tristructural isotropic particle or a triso particle. Uh, think everlasting gobstopper. We take the several thousand of those particles and when we package them uh, with graphite matrix and we press it into a shape, either a cylinder or a sphere. We like to call them pebbles. And that becomes our fuel form. The next step is, okay, how do you generate power? How do you generate electricity? Pile several thousand uh, of these pebbles in a reactor core made of structural graphite. Uh, think gumball machine. And when you get to a certain number of, uh, of, part of pebbles, uh, it starts to go critical. Uh, as, the, as the fuel goes critical, it heats up. Now, uh, we take the heat out by circulating helium through that core. Uh, 750 degrees centigrade is the temperature it comes out at, and then you run it through a heat exchanger. That uh, high temperature steam can either be used for generating electricity or it can be used for industrial processes, which we heard a little bit about uh, in one of the previous panels. The attribute is um, something called passive safety. So these are systems that re don't require an operator to intervene if there's some kind of anomaly. They will shut themselves down if there is some kind of anomaly in the performance. Modular construction, so you can use uh, factories to, to manufacture major systems and components, increase the quality, and decrease the cost of production. And then finally, you don't require um, water either as a moderator or as a coolant for these systems. Uh, we've spent about $80 million to date, $50 million from our CEO, or I'm sorry, from our chairman, Cam Gaffarian, $30 million from the Department of Energy. We've put that money into developing a commercial reactor uh, that's in conceptual design phase today. Uh, we have several more years to go to develop it, and we're looking to have a demonstration reactor operational by 2028. On the fuel side, we've developed a pilot scale fabrication capability at Oak Ridge National Lab, where we have the capability today of producing the triso fuel forms uh, using high assay, low enriched uranium. We have a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy to do the design of a commercial fuel fabrication facility. We'll be done with that in 2021. We can start construction in 2022, and our intent is to start fabricating commercial scale fuel forms before 2025. Thank you. Thank you. So plenty of time for questions. Um, OK, and actually, we're going to start with you, Harlan, and go back this way. Um, what's the biggest, and I'm going to pose the same question to all three of the panelists and then have Jeremy comment more um, generally with regard to Washington but actually the legislative landscape. So what's the biggest or most significant driver in the development of your technology to date and where you, the progress you've made to date? 
So is it strategic collaboration, public-private partnerships, yeah. government funding, market development? What, if you had to pick one, and you can have a backup. Too. Yeah, so, so let me start by saying that uh, the technologies are proven, um, so there are no questions in regards to is it going to work or not. It really is, it comes down to the engineering that it takes to develop these systems. And so I have a, uh, a techno term called the value of death, which uh, several of us have heard in, in this industry, uh, defined as that period of time between when you're doing your engineering development work uh, and spending money uh, to do that, and you don't have any way of generating revenue. Uh, and so you're going net negative in terms of cash flow. Uh, and so uh, for a technology like this, um, we, are not, um, we are not developing an Angry Birds app in our garage. Uh, several hundred <laughs> engineers. Gaylin's right in our basement. Uh, very profitable. <laughs> Gaylin's right in the basement. true. <laughs> Nine foot ceilings. But, but uh, you know, to get to the point of a demonstration reactor requires several hundred engineers uh, you know, with um, PhDs, uh, engineering educations, uh, several years of engineering development to to accomplish that, uh, and, uh, and, and with that period of time, it makes it a, a very unpalatable investment for um, venture capital uh, or the banks to take on. So the, the, the solution that we like is the public-private partnership, uh, and we do look to government agencies like the Department of Energy to, to support that. Having, a, I'll, I'll say, an anchor tenant uh, like the Department of Energy, provides credibility to the design and the, and the approach that's being taken and makes it uh, a more palatable investment for, to make up the, the remainder of that, uh, of that requirement. I'll just add one thing, and that is to, to add a little bit more um, uh, certainty to an investment like that, something like a, public, or a, a, a power purchase agreement where perhaps a government facility says, I am willing to buy, be the off-taker, for the electricity from that facility uh, provides certainty in terms of revenue and makes it, a, again, a better investment to make. Great. Now, Jeremy, it's funny, Jeremy and I were talking before we came up as a result of something Connor had just said before um, in terms of nuclear. And I really think what's helped so many of these, so what's helped the dialogue so much too is understanding and the promotion that's been done around nuclear over the past few years mm -hmm. because nuclear is the longest, right? I always right. say, if you, can, if you can do nuclear or biofuels, you can do anything in this sector. And so especially the importance of public-private partnerships, funding, and long-term collaboration in nuclear, we can't, you can't do it we without that. We think it's that. critical. Yeah. Gaywin? Biggest Money. Money. <laughs> and they cut to the chase. Money. Um, to date, or that's not, we're not to what you need yet. Uh, right now, it's your biggest development. <laughs> uh, our biggest development? Um, That's gotten you where you are. Absolute reliability of our pilot production unit. It, it is a startling little hunk of machinery. You walk in, you hear it run. What, what Dallas believed is that he would be able to adjust the operating condition of the reactor and produce a different carbon. Well, if you're going to run each different carbon for a month at a time, and you've produced over 20 distinct different grades of carbon out of that one unit, that means that you've had the pleasure of operating that unit for over two years. We are producing a very broad range of carbon from very conductive to not conductive. Very conductive goes into tires so you don't build up an electrostatic shock. Very non-conductive goes into the sort of casing on extension cords. But we're pre-revenue because it's a pilot production unit. Going flat out, it makes 0.37 tons a month. Its nameplate is 0.3 tons a month. So it's a good little unit. But it would fit in my basement darn near. We need to get to the 50 ton a month because that is commercial demonstration. We are in conversation with an oil and gas company because they have a supply of CO2. We're also in conversation with a chemical company because they have a supply of CO2. And 45Q makes it possible for them to have a cost reduction. The recent changes to 45Q allow us as a company to transfer the credits that we would earn either to the CO2 suppliers or to the entities that are using the carbon we make. 
So thank you for 45Q. <laughs> the big challenge for us is the money to build out a 50 ton a month unit and operate for the two years that we're doing it so that we have all the capacity pre-sold, those offtake agreements. That's about a 39 to 41 million dollar nut. That's a little bigger than most folks' checkbook. So that's why we're going for industry. Uh, the extent to which there are organizations that want to participate. The DOE can't get in fast enough because it takes time for them to do their due diligence. But they're interested in guaranteeing the loan for the 500, 500 ton a month, and that's two and a half years from now. So we'll start that conversation. <laughs> our technology's proven, our IP is proven. Two international tire companies are telling us our material is making the right difference. Two current carbon producers are testing our material and proving that it provides differentiated performance into rubber. So we've looked at CO2 emitters, we've looked at carbon users, and there are a series of carbon producers that are evaluating our material, and one of them says they can't talk to us anymore because our material makes us look like a competitor. You bet it does. <laughs> our goal as a company is to upgrade the technology underlying the vast majority of carbon manufacture and put CO2 into the human built environment. And the only thing between us and doing that right now at a commercial scale is the money to build that 50 ton a month. Feel free to chip in. <laughs> <laughs> I will pass a hat. <laughs> I have so much to say about that in a little bit, but I'm going to let Steve go first. Sure. Now I get to follow you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think both, both of you hit the nail on the head for several of our same concerns. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the general theme is that the, the biggest thing that makes the biggest impact and difference for us has been the variety of partnerships that we've had, both in the in industry uh, and with the, with the government itself. <laughs> this goes all the way back to our founding. We have, we've been very fortunate to have some VC backing that is very long-term looking. I said in my opening, we've been around since 2011. That's a long time for, for a startup. Uh, but again, we're in the long game. We're not in the Angry Birds space. So, um, so that long game is very capital intensive and you need the right partners with the right uh, alignment of vision and timelines in order to make that work. Yeah. And so in addition to uh, the venture funding and piecing together strategic partnerships with uh, people I mentioned before, BMW, Mercedes, they've been very helpful as well. But the third piece of that is the government engagement. Um, from the very beginning, we spun the technology out of a lab at Georgia Tech, and that technology was funded uh, with some Department of Energy through ARPA-E funding. And we've, we've been lucky enough to continue that relationship with the, with the Department of Energy. So thank you to the, to the last panel. Uh, please keep doing what you're doing. Not yet. Don't thank him yet. He's next for you to go to. <laughs> <laughs> Planting the seed. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, we, we've, had, we've had many uh, opportunities to engage with the Department of Energy, including before we even existed as a company, uh, to now we have a few completed projects and some current ongoing projects. And all of that together has, has really uh, been and fundamental to, to where we are today. And I mean, both, in both respects, and of course, Gay, when you'll, you're gonna get there, but in both respects that we've uh, heard before that, um, with Harlan and Steve, you've had ongoing collaboration with the department, which has really shifted a lot. I mean, I didn't introduce the fact that my, I do government funding, I do public-private partnerships to bring tech to market. That's why I talk about this all the time with, um, with my clients, without my clients, just about how we can do it better. Um, I see people in the audience nodding because they know. Um, but so you got, that's really changed in the past five years, that ongoing collaboration with DOE. I really think it's key to bringing this tech to market. And I'm saying this while I, op I, while I ask Jeremy, because Jeremy's done a lot of the good work on the Hill over the past few years, and ClearPath has really been a game changer on the Hill. So in your work, what do you think has been the big, it's 45Q, is it just grants, is it, I know we have some work to do in ongoing collaboration to get to market, which is gonna bring us to our next question. 
But do you think it's all of the above, or do you think there's one or two? Yeah, it's across it's across the board, but uh, across the board, these type of, of mechanisms that help bring new technologies to the market. So, ClearPath's a conservative organization. We're pushing limited government proposals. Yep. But the key there is limited. Like there is still a role for 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 the government in these areas, and it's a very important role. You know, we work mostly in the power sector space. The way the energy functions in this country, whether you're in a regulated state like a, a Georgia, North Carolina, you have to go to your PSC and get new technologies rate-based. So you essentially have to tell my first technology, which is going to inherently be more expensive because it's the first time I'm doing it, I need to pass on to the consumer. Or in wholesale electricity markets, you just have to bid in into energy or capacity markets depending where you are. And there's really the only incentive to build the cheapest thing. So this public-private partnership is, is extremely important. And that's where there's been this huge policy momentum, particularly over the last three, the last two Congresses, I would say. Um, we've had uh, multiple budget deals that have facilitated significant investments in the Department of Energy's uh, innovation engine uh, to do partnerships like uh, what Harlan was talking about, uh, you know, do a, a cost share to bring a technology to the market. Um, for example, the, the, the department uh, recently announced an agreement with NewScale that they're going to procure their first two reactor, their two small module reactors at uh, Idaho National Lab, and then the other um, of that, that project, the other 10 of that project will be going to Utah um, uh, municipal governments. Um, they've launched a, a moonshot for energy storage last year called the Advanced Energy Storage Initiative to drive down the cost of new, new storage technologies and, and partner together. Um, there's a bunch of bills on the Hill really looking at to try to bring these new technologies in the kind of 2025 timeframe. The Nuclear Energy yeah. Leadership Act, it's demonstrate nuclear reactors by 2025. The leading act um, to do gas CCS projects by 2025. Uh, last night, we heard from Senator Collins, uh, her bill that passed yesterday at a committee, the Better Energy Storage Technology Act, getting long duration storage technologies demonstrated by that 2025 timeframe. There's an urgency here. We need to bring these new technologies and show they're commercially viable. So all these utilities that are, are setting up these, these ambitious emission reduction goals can say, hey, this is a technology I can use. I know that it works and I know pseudo what it's going to cost. And now that you've got the first one on the ground, uh, I'm going to help you drive down the cost and, and deploy it. Um, and so it's, it's these partnerships, it's the tax incentive, like the 45Q tax credit, um, the 45J tax credit, expanding renewable energy tax credits. Um, you know, we've had, you know, some really incredible public policy wins over the last three years. They really don't get the attention that they should. Um, and, and Congress is working together on this stuff. Uh, as I mentioned before, this, this kind of shift is, has been incredible. I would have never told you three years ago that we're, we're you know, increased innovation spending uh, by 25% to bring these new technologies to the market that we'd get a tax deal done in uh, a year and a half ago. Um, and we've got this big momentum that you know, Senator Murkowski and Senator Manchin talked about at, at dinner last night. Um, I think there's a real opportunity. It's because um, all these kind of dynamics are falling into place and, and how are we going to, to bring those new clean yeah. tech uh, to, to commercialization stays? Well, and I mean, just last year, like Connor said, um, I remember Emily from Greentown Labs and Connor were up here talking, and Emily was talking about the pain that companies go through. And I go through that with, I've had the great fortune of working with many that have more than my fair share that have made it versus those that I see at the beginning, I'm like, you're great, you're a great entrepreneur, but it's not going to work. And so that's helped me be more successful. But the point is just I've seen the pain even on the ones that are meant to make it. And the thing that differs between last year and today is that more people understand it more people are working towards it. And it creates a really amazing opportunity for folks like this on the table, but it's still going to take some more work. So with that, very quickly, we have um, six minutes left. I want quickly, and then I want to open it up for one or two questions. Um, and I think we've touched on this again, but I think it's really important to reiterate it. Biggest barrier to market from here. Okay, when we know it's funding, but um, I'm wondering what you guys see. Actually, Steve's response to this, I'm curious. I don't even know what you're going to say, and I've, I've known you a while. So, But Harlan, go first. And what, bi real quick, biggest uh, barrier to market. So, so real quick story. I was at an advanced reactor conference a couple of years ago in Winnipeg. It was during the, during the summer, fortunately. Um, <laughs> utilities, government, uh, industry. And, uh, and it was someone from Saskatchewan Power that said, the challenge here is not whether your technology works, and I alluded to this earlier. We know it works. Question is, you've made financial projections as to how this is going to work economically. 
And, uh, and we don't know if those are accurate or not. You only have X percent of your design done. And so for a utility to make that financial commitment when they're not really sure what the cost to construct is, they're not sure what the cost to operate is, um, creates a lot of risk for them. And unfortunately, looking at um, the, the, the events that have taken place over the last several years at Plant Vogel, uh, in terms of initial $7 billion estimate, now looking at $24 billion, uh, plays right into those fears that the utilities have, which generally we've found to be very conservative organizations. So, so that's our- No, great response. Our, I wouldn't have expected fear to be fear mm -hmm. from a past mistake. Right. Not mistakes, but developments yeah. to be the- Okay, when? When you're bringing a new material to the market, such as what we are doing, although it's carbon black, it's made a different way, therefore, it is considered a new material. There is a real cost to the adopting companies to test your material. One of the things that we're doing with our potential credits from 45Q is saying to those prospective customers, thank you for making the effort to test our material. Thank you for going through all of that development work. We want to be able to give you the 45 credits associated with your adoption of this material to offset that cost, okay? Because being able to offset that cost and then also allowing them to be able to say they're using low CO2 carbon, one of the tire companies calls that sexy. <laughs> so how to make it economically feasible for the adopting entity to spend the money with the confidence that you're going to be there. I like the 45Q for the adoption because we, <clears throat> we realize that all the time. So we can't, yep. I want to reiterate that point because that's something that's coming up. We do a lot of these round tables and discussions. The adoption of the, of the, the to, into the established market is bigger, is really bigger of an issue than people realize. And I know uh, Steve It sure is. It, but yeah. you're next. Yeah, so where we are as a technology right now is all about, <clears throat> it's all about scale up. How fast can we get to that, that scale to actually make a difference? You can't, nobody's going to, no car maker, for example, is going to buy enough material to, to fill one car or even a <laughs> fraction of their fleet. The smallest model line that they make is still a large amount of the material that we manufacture. And so um, the writing is on the wall for them. They know, and all the car companies are pushing towards electrification. And they're pushing us in order to, to drive that better battery, which actually enables electrification yeah. to be practical. Um, but then bringing all those pieces together with those partnerships is really, is really kind of the, the tough thing, finding that, that right mixture yeah. of, of funding, which is you know, and timing. The, key to the capital. Timing of bringing And timing, together. and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Okay, maybe we won't have, do you want to say anything else? I mean, that I, I, I would just like largely agree and, and say like energy is unique, right? Like there, there's longer lead times. And so as Harlan kind of referenced earlier, like VC is looking to get uh, returns in five years. Like you're just not going to get a return from a lot of these type of technologies. It's, it's going to take longer. And so, you know, finding, making sure we get access to capital, finding ways to, to show your, dem your technology works is just critical. And, and that's, a, that's a huge challenge, but I, I think we're making big progress there. I think we are too. Maybe one question from the audience. Anybody have a burning question that they definitely want to ask? We don't have time, but I can actually. Um, so the one thing, actually, and I'm laughing as I'm going to say this. I told Jeremy I was going to say something funny. Oh, we do have one question. I might be slow on the uptake. Hang on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I might be slow on the uptake, but for the advanced nuclear, what's the political soundbite, right, the summary statement for why advanced nuclear is safer than what we know from our experiences in Chernobyl and Japan and Three Mile Island. Yeah, I, 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 I do believe in that, uh, that the word is passive safety, uh, which I mentioned earlier, that, that ability for these reactors, whether it's a molten salt reactor, um, a fast reactor, or the, or the, um, the high temperature gas, uh, if, if I lose all my coolant, if I lose my control rods, uh, my reactor will shut itself down. Uh, and, uh, and that is, uh, and, and I need no operator intervention uh, in order to accomplish that. And I think that's a real game changer for, uh, for the industry. Sound bite enough? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, well, thank you all. What I was going to say in closing is, and this should garner a laugh. But um, about a year and a half ago, because of the pain of working with companies 
like this that didn't have all of the, all of the um, policy that we have and the additional and really understanding of what it takes to get to market. Um, I started getting asked by, from the tech community and biofuels to do some cannabis work. And so I spent the last year and a half doing, making cannabis bipartisan and Republican. And we had, and I say this because a, a crazy vote that blew even my established colleagues away last night occurred. And I, I'm closing with, if we can make cannabis banking bipartisan, there is no reason why we shouldn't be doing more, supporting more, and all working together more for the future of our country and the nation because this comes down to so much more than just climate. It's national security, it's, all, it's innovation, it's American competitiveness, and it really takes everyone in the room in addition to all of these entrepreneurs entrepreneurs and those of us who do it every day. So we can do this, but we do need more help along the way. ClearPath and others, the per people they work with can't do it on their own, and neither can the companies. So any closing, anything else? I think we have 30 seconds. I think Maybe that's you guys want to oh, we're over. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>